Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Look at all the joints you have. They're all created so we can move and do things. Like that. Just lay with a remote control in your hand. On. So bad. Making good habits and breaking bad habits. Last night I laid a, I believe, a pretty good solid foundation, and I really can't go back over much of that just because of time. But I simply want to say that we all have habits. 40%, they say, as much as 40% of what we do is done strictly out of habit. That means we don't even realize half the time we're doing it. We just do it because we've done it so much that it's become part of us. Habits are made through repetition, and habits can be broken through repetition. If you repetitiously do something, you get a habit of doing it. If you, if you repetitiously don't do something, then you can get the habit of not doing it. When you're used to it, you'll miss it when you first stop doing it, but then after a while, it wouldn't even be comfortable to do it again. However, we don't want to focus on bad habits. I'm sure when I said I'm preaching on making good habits, right away you all thought of all the bad habits that you have. I don't even want you to focus on your bad habits. I want you to focus on making good habits. Because I believe if we make enough good habits, there won't be any room in our life for the bad habits. Last night I just talked about the first habit in my book, and there's 14 in here, 14 things that we talk about in the book. And the first one was making the God habit. Well, I said that if you spend regular quality fellowship time with God and you are really educated in the Word of God, that in itself will get rid of a large majority of your other habits. How many of you believe that? That spending time with God really changes things in your life. And so we're going to continue to look at these habits. Two of our foundational scriptures are Romans 12, 21. We overcome evil with good. We overcome evil with good. So we can overcome bad habits by simply making good habits. And the other one was, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, which is Galatians 5, 16. Now, let's look at Romans 5, 5, because the first thing that we want to talk about today for just a few minutes is thoughts and words. The habit of thinking right and speaking right. I'm not going to say a lot about this because in every message I preach, I end up saying something about thoughts and words. However, I can't have a book like this and not say anything about it. So you're about to hear a little bit more about thoughts and words. It's Romans 8, 5. I'm sorry, guys. I gave you the wrong one. Aren't our guys in the back good trying to keep up with us? Okay, now look at this scripture. For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit, set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. And I'd like you to put that back up from the beginning and let me read it to you a different way. For those who have bad habits are controlled and set their minds on those bad habits. Those who have good habits are controlled by them because they have set their mind on those good habits. Where the mind goes, the man follows. Your thoughts always precede your actions. You cannot change a bad habit if you keep bad thinking. You cannot make a good habit if you keep bad thinking. You have to first believe that you can do a thing, renew your mind in that area. The more you think about it, the more you talk about it, the better it's going to be. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, If you've then been raised with Christ to a new life, how many of you believe you've been raised with Christ to a new life? says, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, I love it. And set your minds and keep them set on what is above, the higher things, not on things upon the earth. Now, let me just simply say this to you. God has given you and me an unbelievable gift in the mind. It, it's just, 
Even scientifically, it's amazing how little of our mind we use and what it's capable of and how many functions it provides every single solitary day. Your mind is a, a phenomenal gift from God. And God has also given us this ability that if we really make our minds up that we're going to do something, to be honest, it's pretty much all over after that because you really can do just about anything that you make your mind up that you're going to do. That's why when people say, well, you know, I just, um, I, I, I can't, uh, I can't exercise. Now, don't get mad at me, but the truth is you don't want to. <laughs> well, I, I, just, I just can't get out of debt. It's too big of a problem in my life. Well, the truth is, is you don't want to pay the price to undo the mess that you can I go there? <laughs> the mess that you made. Now, yes, I know there are always unfortunate circumstances. Things can happen to people that were beyond their control. I give you that. There's no doubt about that. But we're just going to say that we're going to talk about our part. And if we live riotously on one end, then we've always got to pay the price on the other end. Dave and I got in debt in the early years of our life using credit cards. And we decided we were going to get out of debt. And I mean, we went a long time. We couldn't buy hardly anything. And it's not pleasant when you do that, but it sure is pleasant when you're no longer in debt. People say, I don't have, I can't, uh, I just, I want to spend time with God. I want to get up and pray, but I just don't have the time. Now look at me, let me tell you something. You have the same amount of time that everybody else does. <laughs> we all get the same amount. We all get 24 hours a day. And it's totally up to you what you do with it. So if you don't have time to spend with God, then you need to just get rid of something else in your life because nothing else is going to work if you don't put God first. So now when I say, if you make your mind up to something, nothing can stop you, I believe that that's a gift that God has given you. You know, there was even one place in, in the Bible where God had to come down and confuse their languages because they had all gotten into agreement. And he said, we're going to have to do something here because they're trying to build a tower to heaven. And there's so many of them that if they imagine that they can do this, they're going to end up doing it. So that in itself tells me that it is amazing what we can do if we just simply will say, I believe with God's help that I can do this. I have set my mind and I'm not going to change it. The problem that we have is we make our mind up and we change it. And then we make our mind up and we change it. And then we make our mind up and the devil talks us out of it. And we make our mind up and then it's too hard. We have to make our mind up and not change it. So if you set your mind for victory, you will have victory. I'm sure you're familiar with 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Cast down wrong imaginations and every high and lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The devil will put thoughts in our mind that are against the word of God and the Bible tells us that we're to cast them down. Now, a little something about words. Let's look at Proverbs 18, 20 and 21. I love this. A man's moral self shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth. And with the consequences of his words, he must be satisfied, whether good or evil. Uh-oh. We better leave that up there a minute, because I don't know if you got it. And <laughs> words have consequences. You know why? Because words are containers for power. I have water in this glass, but I could put mud in it if I wanted to. Well, your words are containers, and what you put in them is entirely up to you, but you will get the consequences of those words. Well, you guys are excited today about my great message. <laughs> the power of life and death is in the tongue. The power of life and death is in the tongue. One more. Idle words leak power. That's what Watchman Nee said. Idle words leak power. Look at 2 Timothy 2.16. But avoid all empty, vain, useless, idle talk, for it will lead to more and more ungodliness. Now, let me just give you an example of idle talk. Matter of fact, if you really just would take a whole day and zip your lip and just listen <laughs> to people, people say some of the stupidest things. <laughs> I mean, things that just make absolutely no sense at all. Like, people will say to me, I get this all the time, 
Joyce, I love you to death. I'm like, don't love me to death, love me to life. I'm working real hard at trying to have a life, not dying. Or we say, this is just killing me, just killing me. We talk so much about death, people talk more about death than they do life. Idle talk, this is just so hard. I don't think I can do this. I'll never change. I'm so stupid. I'll never lose weight. I'll never have a, I'll never be out of debt. I'll never have a good job. I'll never get that promotion. Why in the world, if you're going to spend your time talking, don't you, why don't you say something that's going to help you? Instead of saying something that's going to hurt you and just make you feel worse and worse and worse all the time. Okay, you know why? Habit. We just get in the habit of just saying what everybody else says, or we just get in the habit of just saying wh whatever comes up. You know, all the enemy really has to do is just assign a little demon to be about right here and just suggest thoughts to you, and they just go right in your head and right out your mouth, right in your head and right out your mouth. <laughs> all day long. Well, God wants us to say no to that. And he wants us to be full of the word. And then he wants it to come up out of here, out of our mouth. Out of here, out of our mouth. So are you doing this or this? <laughs> Maybe when somebody says, what did you learn today? You could say, no more of this and a lot of this. <laughs> come on, I'll give you a sermon right there. No more of this and a lot of this. You don't just say what you feel. You say what truth is. Your words and your thoughts will precede all of your actions. So it's not going to do you too much good to try to make any other kind of habit until you first have the God habit. And then through God's word, you let him teach you the power of thoughts and words. And, you know, if you don't have teaching on this, you go back to my resource table. And if you cannot find a message on thoughts and words, then you are not looking. <laughs> because I have got everything imaginable. Matter of fact, I doubt that you could have a problem that you couldn't find a teaching on back there. I seem to have something for just about everything. Well, now we're going to talk about the habit of being decisive. Mm. How many of you have a tendency to have a difficult time making decisions? How many of you make decisions too fast? That's me. Well, some people make them too fast, some make them too slow, and some don't make them at all. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt said, in any, in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing you can do is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. And I like that. Obviously, the best thing to do is the right thing. He's actually saying that you're better off to do the wrong thing than to do nothing. And that's why most people don't do anything because they're afraid of doing the wrong thing. You say, well, why would it be better to do the wrong thing than to do nothing? Because if you're doing nothing, it's because you don't know what's right or wrong. And sometimes the only way you can find out is to do something and see if it works or not. Now, I'm not suggesting that you make foolish decisions or decisions too quick without giving thought to it. We obviously need to think about what we're doing. But once you've prayed thought about something, considered your options, what are you going to do if you don't make a decision? The worst, most tormenting place in the world to be is an indecision. Knowing that you have to make a decision and just absolutely not knowing what to do. And I realize there are some of you here today that you maybe are in a situation and, and you really don't know what to do. Well, you keep praying for a little bit and I believe God will show you, but eventually you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to Try something. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what if it don't work? What if it does? <laughs> and you know what? If you take one little baby step, don't get yourself in too much trouble. You see if God opens that door, and it's like, oh, I'm <laughs> I might be on to something here. <laughs> Amen. Now, if you do this and you get your toe stomped on, then be smart enough to pull it back. Don't just keep going in a wrong direction when nothing is working out.
People who stay in the middle of the road always get run over. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, sir, what is the secret of your success? A reporter asked a bank president. He said, two words are my secret. And sir, what are those words? Good decisions. Well, sir, how do you make good decisions? One word, he said. And sir, what is that word? Experience. And how do you get experience? Two words, the bank president said. And what are they? Bad decisions. <laughs> So he, his whole success was from good decisions. And how did he learn to make good decisions? By making bad decisions and learning from them. There's nobody that ever does it all right, but you cannot. Please don't just keep staying in fear and being afraid to do anything because you're afraid of doing the wrong thing. Now, I believe that there are some reasons why people don't make decisions. Perhaps a person is indecisive because their parents never allowed them to make their own decisions. Parents, please, as your children begin to grow and they add some years to their life, let them make a few more of their own decisions as time goes by until you finally have taught them how to be responsible for their own life. If we keep doing everything for our kids, we cripple them. We have to let them make some of their own mistakes and learn, if you will, the hard way. What's going to work and what's not. You guys are awfully quiet out there. Is that, isn't that right? But see, we want to keep them from getting hurt. I get that. We want to keep them from getting hurt. I tell you, I was really bad like that with my baby, who's now 33. But when I had him, my youngest child, I had three teenagers. We'll just leave it at that. And then I decided I wanted to have a baby, and Dave thought I'd lost my mind, but, you know, we agreed that it was God, and now he's the CEO of Joyce Meyer Ministries, all the stateside ministries, so I'm sure glad I had him, or I'd have a lot more work to do. But because he was my baby and just whatever, you know, I was just wanting to do everything for him, everything for him, everything for him. And, it, you know, if I had it to do over, I would probably do it a little bit different, but a lot of the things that I teach you, I teach you out of my mistakes. And my mistakes are worth me having made them if you can learn something and it will keep you from making some of the same ones that I did. So if you're having a hard time letting go, mom, come on, dad, you're having a hard time letting go. Don't cripple them in the future because you won't let them learn how to make their own choices now. And obviously that's dependent on their age and lots of different things. Indecisive people may be insecure about themselves and their abilities. That's the case with a great many people. I'm having a hard time reading up here today. I can't, the lights are not real great. Let me get down here where I can see. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Satan loves to give us so many fears and insecurities that immobilize us and prevent us from making the decisions that we need to make. Don't be so insecure that you can't make decisions. Being a people pleaser can prevent you from making decisions. You're so afraid that whatever decision you make, everybody won't like it, and then they're going to talk about you or have an opinion about you. You know what? They're probably going to talk about you anyway. <laughs> I mean, they probably are. Probably no matter what you do, they're going to talk about you. One thing's for sure, somebody is not going to like you no matter what you do. So why don't you start just making your own decisions and stop checking to see if everybody around you likes it? Some people are just simply afraid to be wrong. They may be too proud to be able to deal with the thought of having made a wrong decision. Like, practice with me. Say, I was wrong. Somebody watching on television right now, you desperately need that. Honestly, I just got like such a witness in my heart that you're watching and you're like, the biggest thing that you need to do is come to the point where you can simply say, I made a mistake. Don't make excuses about it. Don't try to justify it. Just say, I made a mistake. And you know what? That's all part of the human experience. Making mistakes is part of the human experience. And I think if we really know who we are in Christ, making a mistake doesn't undo us so much. I make mistakes. How many of you make mistakes? Then we might as well admit it and stop letting it control our future. 
And then once a decision is made, you must follow through. Some people may stay indecisive simply to keep themselves from having to be responsible for the work they're going to have to do after they make the decision. I think I better say that one again, maybe. You know, it's kind of like, well, I'm going I'm to make that commitment the first of the year. Well, why do you need to wait till the first of the year? Because you're putting off the pain, the discomfort, the work, the sacrifice, whatever it is. But you know what? It's not going to be any easier the more you put it off. wonder what would happen in life if when we know we need to do something, we just go do it. Get rid of all the mental gymnastics that we do and think it to death, but just decide this is what I need to do, and I'm just going to go do it. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get it over with. I'm going to set my mind. I'm going to keep it set. This thing is not going to be on my mind the rest of my life. Let's just do it and get it done. I want to see some more people be activated in doing what's right in their life. But don't let other people make your decisions. Be God pleasers and not men pleasers. Be led by the Holy Ghost. Amen? I want to be led by the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to talk to you for a minute about healthy habits. And I think I'm going to have to sit down here and just have a little motherly chat with you. I just <laughs> feel like I need to put on my mother hat and talk to you like my kids. <laughs> Are you ready? All right, you guys need to start taking better care of yourself. <laughs> I want you to be healthy. As you get older, I want you to be strong, full of energy. I want you to be able to do everything that God has got for you to do in your life. And I don't want you to use up all the energy that you have now in the first 20, 30 years of your life and then be a worn out mess when you're 50, 60, 70, and so on and so forth. Now listen, and you know, I tell this all the time, so you probably already know, but on my next birthday, which will be in about eight months, I'll be 70 years old. And now look at me, I feel so good. I honestly feel better than I did when I was 35. I have energy, I work hard, but I rest hard too. I've learned to work, I've learned to play. I don't live on junk, I drink lots of water, I exercise, and I know everybody hates the exercise word. You know what, I, whatever you do, even if you just walk, you gotta move. I mean, the point is, is God gave us all these joints that we have in our body so we can move. You have, look at all the joints you have. They're all created so we can move and do things. Just lay with a remote control in your hand. I don't know why I feel so bad. I just Let me show you a scripture that's actually one of my favorite, but it can be just a little bit spooky. <laughs> you ever seen a spooky scripture? Proverbs 18, 9. He who is loose and slack in his work is a brother to him who is a destroyer. Now, why does that say that? Because if you're not taking care of your stuff, then in effect, you are helping to destroy it. It's like Dave shared, shared earlier, what we gain, we have to maintain. And he who does not use his endeavors to heal himself is a brother to him who commits suicide. <laughs> okay, let's have a little confession session. How many of you are not taking care of yourself like you should? You have got to be kidding. <laughs> Give me a cotton pick and break. That was 90% of the room.
Your health is one of the greatest gifts that God has given you. And I can tell you right now, even if you feel good and you're not taking care of yourself, you won't feel good forever if you don't start taking care of yourself now. I see it all the time. And young people, I'm glad you're here, but sometimes you are the worst at this. <laughs> Stay up to 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, get two hours sleep, go to work, who cares? Me? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not telling you not to have any fun, but, you know, you sure got to use some wisdom because I can tell you what, someday you're going to be 72. And I know right now you think that, oh, God, nobody could be that old. Well, you will be that old someday. Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit. Then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and the desires of the flesh. So I just want to encourage you that while you're farming new habits, it's important for you to stay positive and think about the good thing that you're trying to do instead of thinking about the bad habit that you're trying to break. We always have a tendency to focus on, I need to break this habit, I need to break this habit. But really what we should do is focus on the good thing that God is working in us. Be thankful. God, I thank you that you're working in me. Thank you that you're working this good thing in me. And the good will force out the bad.